Welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 57, Anschluss Part 1, The Dreams of Greater Germany. This week, a big thank you goes out to Thomas, Leonard, Jason, Mark, Ryan, Steve, Doug, and Christopher for choosing to support this podcast on Patreon, and to all those individuals who have decided to support the podcast via Apple subscriptions. In both cases, you can gain access to ad-free versions of the podcast episodes, plus special member-only episodes released roughly every month, like the current deep dive into the Royal Navy during the interwar years. If that sounds interesting to you, head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more. Also, as this is the first episode of a new season, I would just like to ask you to consider reviewing the podcast on your podcast platform of choice, should it allow reviews. They are the best way to expand the reach of the podcast, and you would have my eternal gratitude. And also don't forget you can find the podcast on Twitter, Discord, Facebook, and other places, with links to all of those over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. This week we begin our episode, and I promise there will be a series of episodes that does not start here at some point in the future, but we start at the end of the First World War. The end of the war had been traumatic for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It had fallen apart, and the pieces that were left in its wake were left to find their own way. In some areas of the former empire, the path was clear, an independence movement that they had been striving for for generations, sometimes for centuries. But in Vienna and what would become Austria, the question was a bit more confusing and challenging. What did it mean to be Austrian? This was a question that many felt did not have a definitive answer, and one that would be debated within Austria during the interwar years. Which then brings us to the Anschluss, or the joining of Germany with Austria, which would occur in March 1938 when Germany would invade the smaller nation and absorb it into the German Reich. The concept of joining Austria and Germany was not a new idea, though, and certainly not one that originated in Nazi Germany. It was instead something that was quite popular at various points in the past, and during this episode, we will look at the roots of pan-Germanism as a movement in the months and years immediately following the end of the First World War. We will also discuss why that pan-Germanist dream was not fulfilled at that time. The movement would then have an interesting evolution as its strongest supporters in 1919 would be its strongest opponents in 1938, a shift that we will touch on both in this episode and in episode 58. After the First World War, the new Austrian nation had some serious problems. There were economic problems, with the surviving rump state being shorn of many of its territories that had provided it with economic stability. There were geographic problems, with the territory controlled by Austria being surrounded by far larger neighbors. Along with these very real problems, there was also a matter of how the Austrians saw themselves. For centuries, they had been the leaders of one of the largest European empires, a huge empire that controlled the course of Central Europe. With the loss of the war and much of that territory suddenly gone, they were staring down the possibility of being reduced to a secondary power, which, which is never an easy transition for any national group and not something that any of them ever want to go through. In the hopes of finding solutions for these problems, the idea of joining Austria to Germany was supported by the most powerful political group in Austria, the Social Democrats. They would be in power after the war, and they would support both the independence of the various areas of the old empire that were breaking away, as well as joining what was left of Austria with Germany. Beyond just making Austria stronger, they also hoped that this would bring on the possibility of a wider socialist revolution in the new larger Germany and in the nations around it. During the last months of 1918 and the first of 1919, the German and Austrian socialists were the strongest and largest political groups in their respective nations, and the socialist groups in both nations hoped that by combining, they would have greater power within the resulting much larger country. Or as the Austrian socialist leader Otto Bauer would say, quote, In Germany, completely liberated from all difficulties of the national struggle, we would participate in the great decisive class struggles of the proletariat. End quote. The Austrians would move forward with the process, and on November 12, 1918, just a day after the armistice was signed on the Western Front, the new Austrian Provisional National Assembly would sign an Anschluss Resolution, which declared that Austria was now a part of Germany. There was but one problem, and that was the fact that the war was not yet over, and after signing the armistice, German leaders were very hesitant to make any official agreements with Austria out of concern that this would prompt the Allies to demand greater territorial concessions elsewhere, which would negate any of the benefits 
of joining with Austria. This meant that when news of the Austrian resolution reached Berlin, there was not an instant reciprocating agreement which would have finalized the joining of the two nations. Instead, there was no small amount of dithering and delay. By the start of 1919, the delays continued, and, and there were concerns among many that the moment had already passed. One German supporter of Anschluss, Count von Vettel, would record on January 5th, 1919, that, quote, The agitation against the Anschluss has grown like an avalanche. The interpretation of the German government's attitude as cool and the North German public opinion as considering a Catholic increase undesirable receives credence everywhere. The adherents of the Anschluss are discouraged and decline rapidly. Even socialist circles are growing weak. If we do not move soon, Anschluss will be only be an academic demand in the realization of which nobody believes, and a cause to which only few will seriously dedicate themselves. End quote. There would be some official progress, and, and on February 27th, Austrian and German representatives would meet to work out further details of how the union would work. This would result in the March 2nd agreement, which would finalize the broad outline of how Austria would join with the German Reich as a separate member state. The overall structure of this relationship would have been somewhat similar to ones between the national government and states like Bavaria and Saxony. While the agreements had been made, it would remain secret, due once more to concerns about the ongoing peace process, with another great concern being the idea that if the two nations joined before the peace treaty was signed, Austrian war debts and reparations might be transferred to Germany, which was not at all a desirable outcome. Because they could not actually sign the agreement and make the Anschluss official during March 1919, it was mostly just an agreement that they would do so in the future. After the agreement had been signed, plans were made to start working through all the various details that would need to be considered when it actually happened, including topics like economic integration, currency integration, and a whole host of those like smaller details. While there was some uncertainty among the German and Austrian governments about the best course of action, and some fear of ramifications from other nations should the Anschluss occur, in Paris, the representatives at the Paris Peace Conference were making sure that it would not be allowed to happen. They could do this through the treaty that they were drafting, which would eventually be known as the Versailles Treaty, which would officially end the war between Germany and other nations. The three most important nations involved, Britain, France, and the United States, all had slightly different views on the possible Anschluss. The British and Americans were not necessarily against such a development, but they did believe that it should probably wait until the final peace treaty had been signed just to avoid further complications. The French, on the other hand, could not be more vehemently against the joining of the two nations, or to quote a French memorandum on the topic, quote, the French government demands that under present conditions the union of German Austria and Germany be forbidden in the preliminaries of the peace, end quote. The French would even resist the idea of an application of a plebiscite to determine the future course of Austria, stating, quote, Pan-Germanism, of which all the leaders of the present German government have been active agents for five years, has always maintained that Germany, even if defeated, would emerge from the war bigger and stronger due to the annexation of German Austria. Do we want to give a basis to this hope and assure German imperialism, which it cynically anticipates? To act thus would mean giving it a moral reward to the enemy countries which are responsible for the war. End quote. Obviously, France was not a fan. Italy would throw its support, for what it was worth, behind the French sentiment out of fear that Germany would be better placed to make territorial demands on the Tyrol region. There were also other nations that weighed in on this topic, with neighboring nations fearing the expansion of German power in the Balkans, while others with large German populations like Switzerland fearing a pish for joining with Germany from their own citizens. The eventual outcome of all these conversations and concerns would be Article 80 of the treaty, which would say, quote, Germany acknowledges and will strictly respect the independence of Austria within the frontiers to be fixed in the treaty between that state and the principal allies and associated powers. She agrees that this independence shall be inalienable except with the consent of the Council of the League of Nations, end quote. With this article in the signing of the treaty by the German government, the dreams of Anschluss in the years immediately after the First World War were officially dead. 
While there would be no quick movement to join the two nations after 1918, that did not mean that those who supported the change gave up on trying to make it happen. The most popular and vocal group that would support the Anschluss through the 1920s and 30s would be the Österreichische Bucher Volksbund, or just Volksbund. This group was founded in Germany during the period when the immediate unification was still being pursued, but when it became clear that it was not going to happen, the Volksbund began to pursue it as a longer-term goal. Within Germany, the group would focus on simply increasing the support for the Anschluss among German citizens, which included the exact kind of activities that you might expect. Public events, printed propaganda, political lobbying, uh, similar activities. The peak membership for this group would only be about 21,000 officially, but its reach would be far greater. And interestingly enough, even in the very divided realm of German politics, it would prove to be a cause that served as a point of unification and cooperation. Those who supported the Weimar Republic and, and those who were against it on the political right found that they could work together and with each other as they both tried to achieve the Anschluss. In the early and mid-1920s, it was in fact almost a political impossibility to actively advocate against the joining of the two nations. It was seen as anti-German. As the years passed by and still nothing was achieved, the movement in Germany began to lose steam, partially thanks to economic issues in Austria, which caused concern among many Germans who were having their own economic problems in the mid-1920s to, to kind of back away. These concerns became more acute as the German economy began to recover at a faster rate in the late years of the 1920s, while the Austrian economy continued to lag behind. While the Volksbund movement in Germany would always be a relatively small movement, with, you know, numbers in the tens of thousands of members, the movement in Austria would be on a completely different scale. The Austrian Volksbund would be founded in 1925, and over the next six years, it would grow its membership to almost 1.8 million. They would pursue many of the same goals as the German Volksbund and in many of the same ways, but in Austria, the group, the group would be much more politically powerful. Those 1.8 million members translated to around a third of the total population of Austria in the early 1930s. Another similarity between the Volksbund organizations was that in Austria, the membership would cross what seemed to be almost unassailable divisions that were present in Austrian politics. Those that supported the Volksbund would also not just look at the situation at that moment in Austria, but would instead kind of look back into the history, look back into the past to find justification. The 1920s were a period when many histories of Austria would be written, and some of them were written around the idea of finding this historical justification for the pan-Germanism movement. The historians that would create these histories, men like Otto uh, H. Strafficer and Karl Lechner, uh, called back to the imperial past of the two nations, back to the Holy Roman Empire days when the areas that would become Germany and Austria were more closely intertwined. Or, as Gernot Heiss would say in their 1993 article, Pan Germans Better Germans Austrians, quote, In the view of nearly all of the historians who taught at Austrian universities, inasmuch as they voiced their opinion on the topic, which in fact most did in one way or another, Austria was, quote, a state against its own will, end quote. Such inspiration from history was not a justification used by all of the proponents of Anschluss, though. This is where they kind of differed. Because by pulling from history, it was very easy to fall into a glorification of the imperial and monarchist past. Therefore, groups like the Austrian Socialists would reject such notions. Just one example of the political disagreements that would always be fighting against the, the real unifying nature of this pan-German movement that, that would, could never really go away as long as these different political groups were uniting to pursue it. While the Volksbund and support for the Anschluss was a unifying force, though, and in fact almost every major political party in both nations would officially support the movement, this could not solve all of the divisions that were present in the two societies. The problems would be apparent any time the conversations moved into any kind of detailed planning about what the resulting state should look like and what the movement as a whole symbolized. For example, the German supporters of the Weimar Republic saw their support for the Volksbund as a way to counter the claims of their political opponents that they were in some way anti-German. The Republicans saw the Volksbund as a way to further strengthen German democracy and also just 
German self-determination in general, something that had been robbed from Germany by the Versailles Treaty. Support for the Volksbund among the conservative and more radical right-wing parties in Germany was also strong. However, there were often concerns in these groups that the Volksbund as a whole was simply a plot by the left to increase their power. Even with these concerns, support for the union of the two nations was strong, just for different reasons. For German nationalists, the expansion beyond the truncated German territory of Versailles was always going to be appealing. They would also use the Volksbund as a method of spreading their particular brand of what it meant to be German, which often had a strong racial and anti-Semitic component. These different viewpoints would cause support for the Volksbund to ebb and flow among various groups during the 1920s and early 1930s. One high point of support for the Volksbund would come in August 1925, when several hundred members of the German side of the Volksbund would travel to Austria to hold a rally, which was joined by Austrian members as well. To add extra emphasis, the rally was held in the City Hall in Vienna, an important symbolic milestone for the two groups. Then in 1926, a new high point would be reached for the Democratic Socialist parties in both nations, as members of the Schutzbund and Reichsbanner would join in Germany for the Reichsbanner anniversary celebrations. Both of these groups, the paramilitary forces of their respective parties, did nothing to dispel the idea that maybe the Volksbund was really just a leftist front. The two socialist organizations would in general foster close relations during the 1920s, with the leaders in both given honorary positions in the other. But much like other movements between the two nations, they were not identical, with the Reichsbanner allowing non-socialist members, including Catholics, while the Schutzbund was made up entirely of socialists and had a harsh political rivalry with the Austrian Catholic Party. Just like with other differences between the two nations, these problems caused friction and probably reduced the overall support for co cooperation between the groups but was never strong enough to cause that cooperation to cease entirely. Along with the presence of the Volksbund in both sides of the border, and also the Democratic Socialists, there was another shared political party, the National Socialists. In both nations, the two Nazi parties were on similar paths until the Beer Hall Push, which put the German Nazi Party into a sharp decline in the years after 1923, a decline that would not be suffered by the Austrians. The parties would diverge slightly in the last half of the 1920s, which was a time when Hitler was asserting his sole leadership of the party, while at the same time the Austrians favored a more democratic approach to leadership selection. There would also be some philosophical divides between the two groups, with the Austrian Nazis hewing closer to the socialist principles that Hitler purposefully purged from his party. All of this would be resolved in 1930, when leaders loyal to Hitler were able to take charge of the Austrian Nazi party but this would prove to be a bad move for the electoral performance of the party, with many rivals claiming that the Austrian Nazi party was now just an imported group that was controlled from Germany. It did not help that the new leadership of the Austrian party inherited many of the platform policies from Germany, which did not play as well in Austria. There would be a bit of a turnaround over the next few years, if only because the depression would be catastrophic for the Austrian economy. This pushed many people into a search for more radical political options, even from groups that were, by almost any measure, already quite radical, like the Heimwehr uh, paramilitary group. The shift of the Austrian Nazi party into a political platform that was more harmonious with the German party also brought with it a renewed focus on support for the Anschluss, which was not something that the previous Austrian-focused uh, Nazi leaders would have supported. The Great Depression would also be a turning point for the Volksbund movement, just like it was in many other things. Unemployment was a huge problem in Austria, and it caused many to look to the Anschluss as a possible way out of the economic issues that they were experiencing. But then came the Lausanne Conference of 1932, which was a conference that was once again started to reevaluate German reparations that had been outlined in the Versailles Treaty. As part of the agreements made at the conference, the British and French once again insisted that both Germany and Austria extend their guarantee to not push for an Anschluss from the previously agreed year of 1942 all the way out to 1952. This would prove to be a divisive issue in the politics of both nations, but it would still be agreed to by the Germans and Austrians in 1932. In both cases, this was seen as a fantastic opportunity for the Nazi party. In Germany, the support for the Nazi party was already on the rise, 
and they would use the opportunity of the Lausanne Conference to take over the leadership position within the Volksbund movement. This position was simply solidified when Hitler became Chancellor in 1933. At that point, the Volksbund was decisively shifted from a group that was participated in by a variety of political groups to one that was dominated by Nazi members and Nazi leaders. Even before other political groups were outlawed in Germany, their participation in the Volksbund was greatly reduced, including the resignation of Paul Loeb, who had been with the Volksbund and had been its chairman since it was founded. Very quickly, the Volksmann became a group that supported and advocated not just for Anschluss, but an Anschluss that was structured within the context of Nazi racial theory, with the best example being the new membership requirements, which said, and I quote, Every German of Aryan descent who avows himself to the Grossdeutsch idea can become a member regardless of citizenship, end quote. Shortly after this change was made, the Volksbund Executive Committee, which was still a majority of non-Nazi members, voted to simply dissolve the group. In Austria, changes were also being made, with a shift away from supporting full union with Germany and instead throwing their support behind simply maintaining good relations with their larger northern neighbor. The Austrian Volksbund would then be taken over by the Austrian fascists under Dolphus in early 1934 who would be even more passionately opposed to an Anschluss. These big changes on the Austrian side of the Volksbund were mostly thanks to the concerns that people had about joining a Hitler and Nazi-led Germany. At the same time that the Volksbund and Anschluss movements in Austria were changing during the early 1930s, there was also a growing level of political conflict and violence within Austria as well. In the first years of the 1930s, things were very rough in Austria, with hundreds of thousands of people losing their jobs and this caused a rise in support for radical political groups. This included the Heimwehr, founded in 1927, which was a war veterans organization which took its inspiration from fascist groups in other nations, and which would provide support for various conservative groups in the early years of the 1930s. There was also growing support for a variety of conservative, fascist, and communist groups within Austria, as the more centrist Social Democrats and Catholic Party saw their support erode. The communists would even launch actions to overthrow the government in both 1919 and 1927. The action in 1927 resulted in the burning of the Palace of Justice and hundreds of people being injured or killed. Just like in other nations, this increase in violence from the left was answered by an increasingly militant right. There was also a growing push against the left from the government and the police, who were generally far more accepting of literally anybody but communists. The general geography of these movements was that communist and socialist support was concentrated in Vienna, but in the rest of the nation it was quite weak. This resulted in a very divided nation, not just politically, but also between Vienna and other areas. In May 1932, a new government would be put together with Engelbert Dolphus, the previous Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, at its head, and backed by a coalition of center and right parties that gave it a majority of precisely one vote. In the Austrian parliament. Then in March 1933, there were issues within the parliament with an argument uh, around voting procedures, with the most important outcome being that Dolphus personally assumed dictatorial powers by proroguing parliament and ruling by decree. The new government was backed by the Heimwehr and many other groups, but the exact nature of this new government is something that is occasionally still up for debate, with some claiming that it was simply authoritarian and others claiming that it was in fact fascist. The official story was that Dolphus and the new government were the only things that were preventing fascism from taking over Austria. Historians seem to mostly agree that fascism is a term that properly describes Dolphus and his regime, with Aristotle Callus using the phrase preventive fascism to describe the fact that even if Dolphus was originally aiming for a non-fascist regime to fight fascism, it would itself slip into fascism. There would be an almost immediate crackdown on other political groups. The Nazi party would be outlawed in June. The Socialist Nationalist Day of Celebration for the founding of the Austrian Republic would also be cancelled, with those who still tried to celebrate being arrested. This and other measures by the government led to a socialist-backed uprising that would be put down by the government after almost two weeks of fighting all over the country. This was followed by the Social Democrat Party also being outlawed. All the political activity was then concentrated in the new Fatherland Front, or Patriotic Front, which Dolphus controlled. 
In January 1934, he would describe the party like this. Quote, the Patriotic Party does not represent a single movement or a single party. It is an active movement of reconstruction. Freed from the party restrictions of former times, we want to unite all men, irrespective of party, who recognize Austria as their fatherland in order to renovate this country constitutionally, socially, and economically. End quote. A key part of Dolphus's justification for the final and complete removal of democratic processes was that it in some way freed the people of Austria from a problem that they had been having, or something like that. Here's Dolphus again from April 1934, quote, We want true, honorable, and healthy liberty. If today we talk of freedom in Austria, this is not merely a claim to the independence of our country, it means also working to free ourselves inwardly, to free our nation from the hampering restrictions of an earlier period, so that we may all cooperate effectively to build up a happier Austria. End quote. The suppression of the socialist movement in Austria was largely successful, and when Dolphus was murdered in July 1934, it would not be the socialists who were responsible, but instead the Austrian Nazi party. Over 150 members of the Austrian Nazis would assault the federal chancellery on July 25, 1934, and they would shoot Dolphus. This was all part of a plan to overthrow the government after months of low-key violence around Austria, most of which were supported by their German neighbors. Dolphus would die just a few hours later, but the government would continue under the leadership of Kurt Schuschnigg, and it would be Schuschnigg that would lead the Austrian regime during the middle four years of the 1930s. Next episode, we will look at events in Germany during the mid-1930s, as plans for the forceful Anschluss were formulated and the groundwork was laid for the events that would occur in 